night. So thank you for coming back. So before we get going, I want to once again kind of thank all of our sponsors. Of course, um, Boeing, our, gold, our platinum sponsor, Lockheed, our gold sponsor, Aerojet Rocketdyne, and Thales Lee Space, who are silver sponsors, Orbital ATK, uh, our bronze sponsors, um, uh, Mars World Enterprises, which is the supporter sponsor, uh, SGT, uh, for, who sponsored the Buzz Aldrin event last night, Yuingu, who is a STEM education sponsor, Endeavorist, to, uh, if, for those of you who were at the um, screening of the film uh, a couple nights ago, they were generous enough to um, sponsor that. Space News, our media sponsor, uh, the Space Mining and Resources Coalition, MDA, and Science, SpaceX, Ardbeg, our uh, Scotch sponsor for tonight, and Olsen uh, Private Vineyards, our wine sponsor for the lunch today. I also want to thank the Space Policy Institute and all of our other nonprofit sponsors who helped make this possible. So thank you very much. I have just a couple of quick announcements before we get moving. Um, first off, you should all in your packages have maps. For those of you going to the lunch or the reception, you should both all have maps with the addresses to those venues. Unfortunately, if you have not registered for lunch, it's completely sold out. So I apologize, but uh, too late for lunch. But I believe I'm going to hear back later in a few minutes whether we, I think we might still have some spaces for the reception, but I'll verify that later. Uh, also, for those of you who are interested in coming and seeing our briefing on the Hill for the Humans to Mars report, but also the um, Affording Mars report, which is tomorrow at 2 o'clock in the Capitol Visitor Center, please let us know. We need to actually send them a list of guests of people who don't work on the Hill uh, by later today. So if you hope to come, just find me. We'll get you in the system to make sure that you, when you get to the door, they let you in. And also, if you want to help us, we're going to be distributing this and some other items to every member of Congress starting tomorrow afternoon and then also on Friday morning. If you want to help us out, we could certainly use your help. But once again, find me or Rick Zucker. Uh, Rick, where are you? Right over there. Find one of us. You know, would love to have your help in making sure we get uh, the report and, you know, affording Mars as well to every member of Congress. So, uh, no further ado, I want to bring up Harley Thronson, Har Harley's Vice President of Programming uh, for the American Astronautical Society. So, Harley, and he'll introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, just also, I get to do this because with Rebecca Kaiser, uh, we're the um, folks who put together much of, with, with loads of other help, much of the agenda for today. We've got a real treat to start the day. Um, we'll be hearing uh, the, about the, in some detail, some extensive detail, uh, a most recent scenario for an affordable, feasible uh, human exploration program of Mars. I'm happy to introduce the first speaker in that, uh, Dr. Farooz Nadere. I've known Farooz for almost 20 years. He is currently at JPL, the Director of Solar System Exploration, where he oversees missions to multiple solar system objects, as you might guess. Um, he was formerly NASA's Program Manager for, Roma for Robotic Mars Exploration. You heard Scott Hubbard mention that, that together, with loads of other help, uh, he and Farooz put together the Mars Robotic Exploration program of the, the successful program of the last several years, and I first got to know Farouz, oh, it was almost 20 years ago when Farouz uh, led um, and made significant co contributions to the establishment of the uh, Origins program at NASA headquarters. In any case, Dr. Nadari. <laughs> Good morning. Um, can I get my first slide up, please? All right. So um, for the uh, next hour, uh, myself and two of my colleagues, we're going to share with you on some thoughts on a executable uh, Mars program. Uh, you get me for the first 15 minutes uh, to set up the, uh, the context and the framework for the work. Then after that, uh, my colleague, Dr. Price, will give you some details of the, the architecture, technically. And then after that, uh, John comes up and puts it all together. So we call this thing uh, building blocks and puzzle pieces. 
um, uh, because the architecture is based on a handful of um, elements uh, from which we, uh, we build the architecture. And at the end, the program needs to bring uh, together the pieces that make a, a whole program. Okay, so that wasn't good. Um, can I get the, uh, okay, thank you. All right, uh, so by the way of introduction, um, uh, this was um, for the first time outside of NASA, was presented at the uh, TTS uh, invitation only workshop a month ago, and it's also gonna be published uh, in the uh, Journal of uh, New Space. Um, and it is an input uh, to NASA as it tries to uh, establish a framework for how uh, we, we will do um, the journey to Mars. So we don't like for architectures, right? There are quite a few of them out there. So do we really need another one? Okay, so what you see here are uh, some technically elegant um, work by some uh, 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 very smart people. You have some that are technically plausible, maybe with a pinch of bravado. And then you have some that um, they're publicly very engaging, okay, but uh, if not quite real, right? So the question here is why do we need um, another one? So I wanna spend a little bit of time on this chart because I believe that in establishing a, a multi-decade program, there is an art and there is a science in trying to come up with a solution that aligns um, uh, multiple solutions in the categories that I'll talk to you about. S uh, firstly, of course, it has to be technically viable, so there's no question about that. But then on the other hand, if you have something which is technically elegant and viable but unaffordable, it's gonna sit on the shelf, collect dust. It's never gonna see the light of the day. So the second thing is that really needs to, you need to test it for affordability, okay? After that, it is, needs to engage the uh, various stakeholders, and those are, yes, the public, the science community, the Congress, the administration. You are going to need their advocacy if the program is going to be get, getting implemented. So there, is, uh, there needs to be an element of uh, uh, engagement. Then there is the programmatics. Uh, you know, how do we bring in the internationals? Uh, you know, this going to Mars, Inevitably, I've heard a lot of people say it's going to be uh, people of the earth going to Mars, multiple nations. So you need to have uh, a certain uh, level of details expressed so that the internationals can come to the table and uh, see themselves in elements of what you're, uh, you're presenting. You can't be too vague because there is an opportunity cost of uh, withholding uh, specifics. Uh, your international partners don't know how they fit in. And then there is a, the political dimension, right? It is, uh, Mars is inherently a multi-administration, multi-decade journey, right? And fortunately, in the current environment of the partisan politics, sometimes when the journey is associated with a president, that may be the kiss of death when the next president comes. So you need to find a way to uh, allow the different administration to get a win uh, on their watch. But uh, at the end, you have to perform. Uh, if you perform, I think admin, you know, the politicians love to take a selfie with the successful people, right? So if you perform, I think everyone wants to get a little bit of the credit. So that's the, the bottom line. Now, what we will talk about today is uh, the first three, right? Uh, the, the, pol the political and, and international, it really is within the purview of what NASA headquarters uh, does. It was outside the, um, uh, the work that uh, w you know, we could do in this study. I specifically now want to talk about the <coughs> uh, two of these things. The, uh, when you uh, try to put a Mars program together, very soon you find out that you have two competing constraints, okay? The first one 
is that you have to deliver something within the interest horizon of your stakeholders, right? What was the, one of the most powerful things with Apollo was what? It said, by the end of this decade, all right? So if I was 18, I knew by the time I'm 28, uh, you know, I'm gonna witness something special. If I was 35, you know, I would be around at 45 to see it. Even if I was 70, you know, it was within my interest horizon, right? Is anybody really gonna get excited to say we're gonna go to Mars in 2070? Or even uh, worse yet, sometimes in the future, but we don't know when, right? So you always have the pressure to uh, provide something where people feel, okay, something special is going to happen, I'm gonna be a part of it, I'm gonna witness it, and so you know, that has to be there. But that runs headlong into the other constraint, which is the uh, annual NASA budget, right? In order to pull things forward, you, know, you press here, the budget peaks up there. And uh, so we started by um, in, uh, in, in uh, establishing a self-constrained uh, self-imposed constraint, and that was that, yes, as you heard yesterday, likely they're not gonna be another Kennedy moment, so we said that we will try to fit in within the current NASA budget adjusted for inflation going forward. Okay, so that was a, and so when we did finish the, uh, the architecture technical work, we subjected it to costing, uh, at least feasibility, to show that it plausibly fits within the constraint that we set up. Okay, <clears throat> just to illustrate the point, uh, less than a year ago, National Academy did a uh, exercise that said we're gonna land on Mars in 2033, which is a laudable goal, but as you can see there, you know, the flat line is the current NASA budget, the dashed line is it with inflation, and uh, even with that, you can see that in late 2020, this thing really peaks uh, to twice or three times the NASA budget, so, um, <clears throat> clearly not, uh, not doable. So how do you make it uh, affordable? You know, we took uh, two tacks. One of them was that we're going to break it up into pieces so that you have a cadence of uh, exciting uh, work going on, but you don't put it all together in a single mission that's going to uh, 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 cause you difficulty with the cash flow or the annual budget. <clears throat> and the other one is, uh, well, National Academy did it recently, so they, you know, and they said it wasn't possible within the budget, so what did we do different? And the thing that we did different, we said that we were going to do it on a architecture which is as simple as necessary, as possible, but enough to do the job, right? And so you heard this thing yesterday that we uh, are going to rely on a handful of um, elements, which either NASA is developing right now, it is, or it's on their um, drawing board, and don't go after exotic technology. So, for example, at the beginning, we decided that we weren't going to do nuclear thermal propulsion, right, and try to do, uh, make do with things that NASA is already uh, has on its plate. So, the other thing is that uh, we're going to break up the architecture. Uh, you know, going to Mars and coming back, it's, it has a tremendous challenge, uh, you know, to send uh, astronauts there and, you know, bring them back safely. Uh, you know, as we've been getting education from our colleagues in uh, JSC and uh, getting, internalizing more how difficult it is to send astronauts out uh, and bring them back you know, on a, a thousand day trip. Okay, so, so if on top of that challenge, you impose also the challenge of going to the surface and lifting off from the surface, it just adds up to one badass mission requiring a lot of money that you can't afford, okay? So the first thing to do is to break that up into a couple of missions. First, you come up with an architecture to take you there, and then later on, you repeat that same architecture, but you add the elements of going to the surface. So I, you know, I, I, I like sports and I like using sports analogy. And so my sports analogy here is you can always go to the uh, plate trying to hit a home run. With one shot, get everything done, right? And if you're baseball fans, you know even the best home run hitters of all time, they struck out more than they hit a home run, 
there are different ways to score a game. Maybe you hit a single, you go to first. Maybe on a bunt, you go to a second. Maybe you steal third and come home on a sacrifice plan. At the end, you score. And it is not any less engaging and less exciting to the people in the stadium than is the fellow that hits a home run. And in fact, you end up spreading the risk and um, you, you know, taking the, the public along with you. So uh, here are, are the, uh, the blocks that we uh, decided to uh, use in, uh, in our architecture. Uh, on a launching from the ground, of course, you need the SLS and you need the, uh, uh, the exploration upper stage that it's, uh, will be, uh, it's on a drawing board by NASA. Then uh, in space propulsion, you heard a lot about the, <coughs> uh, the solar electric propulsion tugs and, and you hear more about it today. And we also need some chemical uh, uh, stages. Uh, then you need the uh, crew quarters, uh, you need Orion and you need the habitat. One is being built, the other one NASA is uh, just beginning to uh, engage the industry on. And of course the, uh, the toughest of all is uh, you know, getting the, the technology to go to the surface and lift off from there. So it is all of these building blocks that you'll see Hoppy try to uh, put an architecture together. And uh, then at the end, um, you need to bring it all together, right? Uh, uh, what about the space station? What's the end game looks like, whenever it is? Uh, what's the end game look like uh, for the space station? Uh, we're gonna go to cislunar to do certain uh, testing of the elements. How does that work? Uh, if we are, you'll see that the first mission we're proposing is gonna go to the moon of Mars, uh, Phobos, and then eventually on Mars. And then out on that side you see maybe down the road a permanent outpost uh, in, in on Mars. How do these pieces come together so that there is not a discontinuity between each of the elements? Uh, you know, you have uh, bought puzzle uh, and you've seen the coherent picture or the, the picture on a box, right? And all the pieces are jumbled up inside. So how do you put these pieces together so that picture on a box emerges? So you'll hear a little bit about that uh, from my colleague, uh, 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 John. Okay, so uh, with this, let me uh, introduce uh, our, our next speaker, uh, which is uh, Hoppy Price. Uh, he was our architect, uh, chief architect in trying to put together the, uh, um, and he will tell you the details of uh, what we did. Okay, great, thanks, Farouz. So, let's see. Okay, so um, the concept for the Phobos landing mission, it would be a mission that we would propose for 2033 that would be a precursor to the Mars landing mission. So this is getting people to Mars orbit and back again. It uses four SLS launches and uh, we use SEP tugs to pre-position assets in the Mars system. Prior to the crew arrival, we get those in place and we're looking at a round trip crewed mission of about two and a half years and we would spend about 300 days at Phobos. So this is a, a bat chart of the architecture, and the first two launches are getting cargo out to, uh, to Mars, and the second two launches are getting crew out to Mars, and uh, you can see that we're staging things in a highly elliptical Mars orbit at Mars, and then the crew is going to a, a highly elliptical Earth orbit. Those are the, uh, what, what we think are the two best places to stage things from an energy standpoint for getting there and from coming back. So the first launch uh, is a SEP tug, and it's a 100 kilowatt system, and it injects its payload uh, to Earth Escape, and uh, it takes about uh, uh, the SLS it injects it to Earth Escape, and then the SEP tug takes it out to high Mars orbit. The trip time is about 3.8 years, and uh, the the payload that we have here is a, a, a Phobos transfer stage that's used to take the crew in Orion from high Mars orbit to Phobos and then back again. And then there's a trans-Earth injection stage, and that's what is used to, to bring the crew back home again when they're done with their mission. And the second launch is similar to the first one, uh, but the payload is a Phobos habitat, and uh, uh, the SEP tug would uh, take the habitat all the way out to the Mars system and actually uh, land it on Phobos, pre-position it there. And the SEP tug would remain with the habitat to provide power because if it's providing 100 kilowatts at Earth, you get about 50 kilowatts at Phobos, so that's a fair amount of power. 
and then the habitat is envisioned being a common design with the, uh, the deep space hab that's used to take the crew out and back. So, so you would expect them to come off the same assembly line. So now we've, uh, we have two SEPTUG launches. We've gotten our assets here pre-placed in the Mars system, and so now we're, we're ready to send the people out. And uh, there, are, there are two launches that are used to get uh, the crew there, and I'll, I'll go through those in a little bit more detail. The third launch is an SLS Block II, and that's carrying a, uh, the deep space habitat and also a Mars orbit insertion stage. So the MOI stage is used to put the entire crew stack into orbit around Mars. And then uh, uh, that stack, after it gets out uh, to high Earth orbit, uh, is, is going to wait for the crew. So the first launch gets it to high Earth orbit. It's going to loiter there for maybe six months or so. And then you're ready for the next uh, SLS launch. And that's carrying the crew. And so this is the launch that has to be timed for the departure window to Mars. The earlier launches actually had a lot of flexibility in, in when they could have launched. And so this launch is to high Earth orbit. It docks with the deep space hab in the Mars orbit insertion stage. And then uh, there's enough uh, propellant left in the exploration upper stage that's only carrying Orion to uh, be able to reignite and then send that whole stack off to Mars so you didn't have to buy a separate Earth departure stage. You're actually using what you have with the SLS. And so now you're sending the, the entire crew stack out to Mars, and that takes about uh, 200 to 250 days, depending upon the opportunity we're looking at. And then the MOI stage injects that whole stack into uh, high Mars orbit. So uh, now we have uh, the crew out in high Mars orbit. It's going to meet up with the other stuff, and, and I'll describe how the crew would then get to Phobos. So um, the deep space hab. Uh, and the pre-positioned trans-Earth injection stage will remain in high Mars orbit. Um, when, when you go into orbit around Mars, the, you, you get rid of the Mars orbit insertion stage, and then you pick up the TEI stage and dock that with the deep space hab so that that's pre-positioned for the return trip. And then the Orion would dock with that Phobos transfer stage, and that would take the crew in Orion down to the habitat, and then later on bring it back up again. So uh, the, the crew would spend about uh, 300 days at the, Phobos hab at the Phobos base, the habitat there. So this is the concept we're looking at. There's a deep space hab. There's a docking port here. This is the transfer stage for Orion that took the crew there and will bring it back. And then the crew arrives in Orion. The SAP tug is still here, providing uh, power for the whole system. And uh, this supports a crew of four. That's what we sized it for. And since you have the, the SEP tug here, which also has chemical propulsion too, uh, the, the crew could stay in one place for a while, and, and, and you could possibly relocate it to another part on Phobos. And then this is an asset that would remain here, and, and uh, future crews would also be able to use that. So uh, coming back from Phobos, the uh, crew would uh, use the Phobos transfer stage to get back up to high Mars orbit. They'd meet up with the deep space hab and the trans-Earth injection stage. And uh, they would use the trans-Earth injection stage to come back home. And uh, in this concept here, uh, the crew enters in the Orion capsule. It's a direct entry to Earth. And everything else is, is, uh, is, is gone, except actually you, you can save some of the stuff if you want to. Those two SEP tugs that were out at Mars, if you leave about a ton of propellant in each one of those, they can actually uh, uh, come back to Earth. So you could actually recover the two SEP tugs, bring them back to uh, high Earth orbit or uh, lunar orbit and reuse those. And then the transit habitat, you could actually send that on a course to, to do a, a deflection so that it misses the Earth. So even though the crew's coming in and Orion, the deep space hab could actually be rerouted and then picked up actually by one of the returning SEP tugs. And so you could actually recover the deep space hab and, and use that again another day if you were able to refurbish it. So uh, you know, there are certain key building blocks that we use in this architecture. And uh, Farouz talked about some of those. Orion and SLS are, are being built. Uh, I'll talk about some of the other ones. This is the uh, uh, SEP tug that's being developed for the ARM mission. And it's a 50 kilowatt system uh, designed to carry nominally eight tons of xenon for that mission, has four hull thrusters. And so the concept is to uh, uh, come up with a block 1A that we would use for this mission, which basically uses the same bus, the same tankage, the same avionics, but we would double the solar arrays and double the thrusters. And ARM is actually being designed to carry up to 16 tons of xenon. So uh, in, in this block 1A, it would, would come off the same kind of uh, delivery line as, as the first mission, but it would be capable of doing the, the SEP tug missions. The, this is one concept for a deep space hab. This would support a crew of four 
for 500 days. That's to get to Mars and come back again. There would be a, basically a copy of this. It would be a, in the Phobos base. And that's about 30 tons, and it requires solar arrays and batteries for power, but attitude control would be provided by the attached uh, uh, propulsion stage or by Orion when the crew is there. And the uh, in-space chemical propulsion stages, we need three of those, the MOI stage, the TEI stage, and then the Phobos transfer stage. And so these are basic hydrazine NTO biprop stages, pump-fed engines, uh, 500 kilonewton thrust, that type of a stage. So it's really very similar to a Titan II second stage, a Dnepr second stage, or a Proton third stage. So uh, it is a, a challenging new design, but, but it's not uh, you know, exotic new technology. So now I'll talk about uh, a surface mission. So what we've done is, is, is we've put in place now a system for sending people to Mars and back, and we proved that out with the Phobos mission. So now we need the lander. So for this uh, example here, we looked at a lander that had a 23-ton useful landed mass. It is, it is a fully fueled MAV. It's a single stage, and it uses hydrazine NTO. And because of that, uh, it actually can only get to low Mars orbit when you come back, back, when you come back up again. Uh, so I'll talk more about that. Um, so the lander requires two, can I go back? Uh, there we go. Yeah, the lander requires two additional SLS launches relative to the Phobos mission. So now you have six launches. Uh, and the lander is sent with that, that two SLS launch scenario. So first you launch the lander to a higher Earth orbit, and then the second SLS launch injects that to Mars. And then when, you, when the crew leaves Mars, uh, it uses a two-step approach. The, the MAV only takes it to low Mars orbit, and then you have a, a stage that's pre-positioned there that can take it back up to high Mars orbit to meet up with uh, the return vehicle. So this is looking at uh, two crew for this first mission. And so this lander at, at 23 tons, uh, you have different ways you could load it up. You could have a crew of two and carry lots of resources and supplies so that they could be on the surface for a month. For follow-on missions, if you wanted to get a crew of four down, you could put a crew of four in the vehicle, but you couldn't carry supplies for a month. You could only carry supplies for about a week. So it has that amount of flexibility. You could look at a scenario where you had a crew of three, and they could only stay for two weeks. So there's different options you could play there. So looking at the batch chart, I think my laser pointer is uh, it's, it's kind of weak. Anyway, uh, the launches are pretty much the same as the Phobos mission, except we've, we've uh, added two more vehicles. This launch number three and four is getting the lander there. So this first launch uh, gets the lander into high Earth orbit, and then the second SLS launch uh, doesn't have any payload. It's just the exploration upper stage with all of its propellant, and it has, it has enough propellant left in there to where after it docks to that, it can inject the lander to Mars. Since it has a big heat shield, we actually aero capture that into high Mars orbit. And so now you have all this stuff in the Mars system waiting for the crew. The crew would get there the same way it did for the Phobos mission. And, uh, oh yeah, there's a, a brighter pointer there. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. All right, so uh, the uh, crew would get to Mars the same way. And, uh, and, and so two of the crew would transfer to the lander in high Mars orbit, and then they would deorbit that, uh, stay on the surface for, uh, for, for three or four weeks, and then they would use the MAV to come back to uh, low Mars orbit. Uh, they would get that boost stage and come back up to high Mars orbit, uh, and then the rest of the mission would be the same. Uh, in the previous mission, we had that Phobos transfer stage, and so now we have something that's pretty much the same size and same design, but we have solar arrays on there. So after this got into the Mars system, we actually used aero braking to get that down to low Mars orbit, and that's where this stage awaits for the crew to come back up so we can bring the MAV back up to high Mars orbit. So this is the lander we looked at, and, and we looked at a, a pretty simple design. It's 12 meters in diameter, so you need to launch it in a hammerhead configuration on the SLS. Uh, it's basically just heat shield and rockets and a crew cabin. There's no deployable decelerators. There's no parachutes. Uh, so it's a pretty simple system. Um, let's see. Move on to the next chart. So this is the, uh, the EDL concept. Uh, there's entry, peak heating. The peak deceleration is about 6.4 Gs. Uh, you go into hypersonic aero maneuvering, and then actually at about uh, just above Mach 2, you uh, light the rockets and you use supersonic retropropulsion, and there's about a minute and a half uh, propulsive phase, 
and uh, in the end there's a constant velocity phase and touchdowns at less than five meters per second. Uh, now this is a 12 meter diameter vehicle. We're, we're going to do a little bit more work on this. We're going to look at a 10 meter diameter, probably an 11 meter to see what's really optimal. So one option would be to have a 10 meter diameter vehicle and, and use an LDSD type SIAD to, to try to slow it down. And so we will also look at that option and trade off the fuel savings versus the complexity and the cost of having the, uh, the SIAD in the system. So supersonic retropropulsion. Uh, all of our Mars landers to date have used subsonic retropropulsion. And so to get us to that subsonic regime, we have parachutes and all kinds of things to, to get us down there. Uh, but if you use supersonic retropropulsion, that opens up a lot more options. Uh, and SpaceX has actually done this for the Falcon 9. And this is actually a view from the Falcon. This is a view that uh, from, from some NASA data that was taken. And people have done some simulations of this, but at this point we have seven flights that SpaceX has done, so we do have some confidence that this would work. And, and a lot of the SRP done by SpaceX is actually in a regime of the atmosphere that pretty much simulates the conditions that it would see at Mars. This is another view of the lander concept. Uh, this first mission would probably be something like Apollo 17 in scope, so we envision it would have something like the, the old Apollo lunar rover uh, and, and, and they would be able to conduct science investigations for a couple of weeks on the surface before they came back up. Of course, the follow-on missions would uh, carry a crew of four and there would be more assets in place for that. Uh, this is just a view of what the ascent would look like. That's a concept there. Uh, the, the vehicles that we use in this architecture, uh, you know, there's the, the Boeing study of six not-so-easy pieces, and so we hope these are six easier pieces to use for this mission. So we need six Orions. Uh, six, uh, I mean, one, one Orion, six SLSs, two SEP tugs. Uh, we only need one deep space hab, but for the lander missions, we actually need another thing that looks like a hab but has resupplies in it because we need to resupply the hab in Mars orbit. Uh, there's three chemical propulsion stages, one Mars lander and a partridge in a pear tree. And uh, now you have all the vehicles that you need to go to Mars. And uh, these are all fairly high TRL concepts here, and so that made it easier to do some of the costing that John Baker will talk about soon. Uh, so looking towards a more permanent presence, the follow-on missions would have one-year surface stays. You would do a version of the lander. It would be the same EDL design, but instead of the MAV, you'd have a habitat on there. There'd be another version that could have a, a, a pressurized rover and other supplies for science investigations. Uh, so the idea is that the future missions would carry a crew of four each time, and then you could build up infrastructure on Mars with these extra cargo launches, and the program would evolve eventually, I think, to uh, something that would be a more a reusable architecture, going to buzz the cyclers or other systems where you would have uh, a, a more reusable system and a more robust system for getting the crew in back and getting more people to and from the Mars system and being able to get more landers there. So you could evolve to using in-situ uh, in resource utilization on Mars and evolve towards using more complex elements. And of course, once you find a water source on Mars, uh, hopefully we would evolve to a permanent presence with an Antarctica-type population that we could achieve on the surface of Mars. So now I'll hand this over to John Baker, and uh, he'll talk about some of the programmatics. All right. Thank you, Hoppy. Good morning. My name is John Baker. I'm from JPL. I have about uh, 30 years of human spaceflight and robotic deep space uh, mission experience. And I'm going to talk to you about how we begin to put all of the different pieces together into a meaningful timeline that we think is affordable. So we, I'm going to talk to that. So the first really critical piece is, imagine you have a new car, and it's the first time you've built this car. It's an experimental car. And you decide you want to, what do you want to do with this car? Well, you want to try and drive it down the street, around the block. And how do you then get comfortable with this particular car that you're going to be traveling a great distance with? Well, so you, you, you gradually find yourself wanting to do more and more with it and, and expand your, your range. So very similarly, what we decided to do was uh, for all of the new elements that are being developed, and, and there are already existing plans for SLS and Orion to test in cislunar space or in the lunar proving ground, very similarly, all the other elements you just heard about, including the deep space tug, the deep space habitat, um, Mars landers, 
and uh, the vehicles that you're going to need. You also want to do something similar as well so that you're kind of testing them in your backyard and learning how to operate with them before you go the 200 million miles one way to Mars and then hang out there for a year and a half and then come home. So, uh, so what we've done is laid out a series of missions here. Um, the first, this is already planned, this is EM1. Uh, we then do a SEP tug demo in 2020 timeframe. Then we do the first Orion flight in 2021. This is uh, EM2. And then from here on out, we added our own series of flights, uh, a Orion, second Orion test flight, and then finally a couple of what we call Mars simulation flights. And this is kind of our idea of how would you then check out the habitat in addition to the crew transportation systems and get comfortable with that all of the elements and all the hardware and all the systems that you're going to rely on are, are really going to work the way you want them to work. So we, we build on a series of increasing duration missions, uh, what we call Mars Sim 1 and Mars Sim 2. Meanwhile, uh, while you've heard that uh, SpaceX is doing supersonic uh, retropropulsion here at Earth, uh, we think it's important to demonstrate a subscale version of the lander uh, with at Mars. And so we've incorporated a robotic test uh, called robotic EDL test. Uh, by the way, the blue is here at Earth, uh, red is at Mars, and green is in cislunar space. So we're doing a robotic test here in the mid to late 20s, uh, which will give us the confidence we need and reduce the risks on the systems and the technologies that we want to actually eventually land humans with at, the, at Mars. Meanwhile, uh, we have the ISS continuing to go till 2028. Um, as many of you know and heard yesterday, the ISS continues to do a lot of work in the domain of risk reduction for humans. How do you deal with all of the zero-G effects and the countermeasures um, and, uh, and really get yourself comfortable that you can maintain human health uh, on a really long journey? And then finally, we have our first in 2033, our first crewed mission to Phobos, um, based on the architecture that Hoppy presented. And, um, and they, they come back 30 months later. Um, and then the next major flight here is, this gets a little confusing, but we're actually doing testing the Mars lander system. This is the propulsion systems and everything else and all the, the guidance systems that you need. Um, it turns out that if you design a lander for Mars, uh, we think it has suitable performance to actually be used at the moon. And so you would actually do a test flight at the moon, again, testing out your new vehicle kind of in your, on your, on your, around your block uh, before you take it all the way to Mars. And then finally, once you've done that, you begin your campaign here to do your actual crewed mission and you launch your first crewed flight to Mars in 2039. And meanwhile here, you're, you begin to build up your infrastructure, and then we actually get into a cadence where uh, then you actually are able to have a much longer duration mission, a one-year mission, uh, also called an extended stay mission beginning in 43. The, um, what, you, the, what you'll see coming up is the, the series of flights or the manifest that we created in order to do this. So here's our notional manifest. Um, same series of flights, but laid out a little bit differently. Um, the crewed flight to Phobos actually involves four launches. The surface missions involve six launches. Um, and here's how, we, from the beginning, EM-1, the SEP demo, EM-2 test flight in the cislunar space, and then beginning a series of incremental, incrementally, uh, incremental missions that add capability, get comfortable with the flights, as well as increasing in duration and giving you more and more confidence that what you want to fly in into Mars is going to work. Uh, and then finally, uh, we do our Phobos campaign here. Um, and then here's our crude test of the Mars lander at the moon. And then finally, the six missions here that actually give you your first crew to the surface of Mars or footprints on the surface of Mars. Um, we continue to assume that ISS is, like I said, going till 2028. And then there's a series of lunar flights. Uh, there is a flight gap here, and you'll see why that, that gap is here. This particular manifest is a, a, an affordability-driven manifest. It's not uh, if you, you, of course, everybody wants to do more. Uh, but we ended up, end up doing several iterations with uh, Aerospace Corporation on what could we actually afford to do. 
And so you end up with this, this kind of, these number of flights. And unfortunately, a gap here be, for about four years between the end of ISS and when you would start flying to Mars. Okay, so the next piece is the cost affordability or, or the affordability sanity check. And here's where we actually employed aerospace to, um, to do some work for us. They had recently finished their pathways to exploration report for the NRC. They had all of the cost models already loaded up. Um, and uh, we, we went through that with them and under, tried to understand what they were really doing. Um, and they, they use uh, cost models. At this stage of the game, that's pretty typical. So you're looking at parametric estimates. Uh, they add a fair amount of cost uncertainty to that, so there's 50% margin on top of what their estimates are. Um, that's not unusual, and, but also the uncertainties of the cost of the stage of the game are also higher. So all that said, we still think what we're, what we're going to show you at least points to the fact that this particular kind of architecture is actually plausible uh, with, with in terms of affordability. Uh, and then here's the original cost plot that we started with. This is what happens when you try to land in 2033. Um, and the, the, this is based on the NRC study, which at that time only had one architecture, which was the DRA-5 architecture. Um, you can see that it requires a significant in increase in funding for NASA. Um, and then there, that makes it really difficult to, to implement. So if you stretch the schedule out here, uh, so the NRC also looked at both you know, schedule driven or funding profile limited. This is a funding profile limited and this basically pushes the launch out to the mid 2020, you know, 21st century uh, with 2046-ish types of landing and again based on DRA-5. And so this is, a, this is the point of are you really gonna capture the public's interest if, you're gonna, if you say, well, we're going to land humans on Mars, but we're not going to do it until 20, the mid-21st century. So this is the result of the work that we did where they took our architecture and our flight sequence and actually put it to the models. And you can see that with the uh, inflation line here, uh, we peak a little bit above the inflation line. Um, this particular hump right there is the beginning of the development of the, lunar, of the Mars lander. And, uh, but there are also valleys in here where you could either uh, smooth out your budget profile. We didn't try to do a lot of smoothing. Or you could you know, move things to the left in terms of schedule. Or you, in, in some of these cases out here, you can begin to on-ramp technologies that make your whole architecture more efficient. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to make clear was that because these, this particular architecture is a much higher technology readiness level, uh, we think that the cost risk itself is actually much less, uh, as well as the schedule risk, because the total cost is less, and, uh, and you're, you're, again, you're not doing a lot of new miracle development in order to make something happen. Uh, this is what happens if you, uh, in the prior, let me just go back one. So one thing here is we had ISS to 2028. Um, right now, I think the policy is 2024. But we went to 28 just to see what would happen. And this is what happens if you go ISS to 2024. Um, this is uh, obviously going to be a subject of debate for some time in terms of how long is ISS really useful for. Um, this is not our, we're not advocating for this. We're just saying this is what happens when ISS goes to 24. Uh, you end up smoothing out the budget somewhat. And uh, there's, a, there's an opportunity here, again, to either move things to the left or to add additional test flights in cis lunar space. But this shows that you can actually send Phobos, you do a Phobos crewed mission in 2033, a short stay mission in 2039, and then begin your series of long stay missions in 2043. So this particular study that we did um, is really intended to be an example of what's possible for um, how you would send humans to Mars in a time frame of interest and also in a way that's affordable. Um, the making all the trades between the technical, the scheduling, as well as the risk is also a really key important thing. And so we took a first, this is really our first stab at it. Um, and uh, so this is where program system engineering becomes really important. 
So in conclusion, we believe Mars is possible um, and, that, uh, and in a time, frame, time horizon of interest. Um, what you need is a clearly articulated strategy, one that allows you to begin to engage stakeholders, a budget adjusted for inflation, and finally, an affordable architecture, one that allows you to uh, spread the campaign over time into a series of exciting flights, as well as um, gives you the affordability, kind of uh, allows you to fit under the budget line. And finally, we hope that this particular example, while it is just an example, uh, we, know, we know quite well, having been through the life cycle, that what we're showing you here is not what ultimately is going to fly to Mars. There'll be lots of incarnations and lots of iterations. So you can bet that you're going to see improvements on this, uh, just as we use this architecture to build on prior studies. Um, you're going to see future studies that will build off of this and probably do better than what we did here. And uh, with that, I think we, what we're trying to do is really just give you a series of principles and examples that will hopefully frame the future for sending humans to Mars. Thank you. Didn't need the time cue. We have uh, around 15 minutes, 13 minutes or so for questions. So I'm sure there are lots of questions. And Hoppy and Fruce, why don't you come up and, and uh, and join us. And um, John, I'll be happy to, oh great, and I'll be happy to let you call sure. on folks who have questions. Actually, I'll use the moderator's uh, prerogative to ask the first question. Um, in this, in the um, time frames that you worked out, the uh, mission to Phobos and then the, then the short stay mission and so on, as you guys know, did you do much orbital analysis. There are some optimal, independent of cost, independent of technology, there's some optimal windows. One opens up in 2033-ish, closes out 2036-ish. Did that figure into your... Hoppy, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, and yeah sure. That. Yeah, yeah, let me use the, the, the microphone here. Yeah, yeah, we looked at a number of different options in, in years, and so we, we actually uh, took a, a worst case year for doing our performance analysis. So the idea is that this architecture would, would, would be feasible in, in, in any year, but uh, 2033 is a particularly good year, and so uh, the performance is higher there, so you would, you would have higher mass margins. And if you were able to accelerate the program and maybe you could do some of these missions earlier, you know, you'd always want to keep in mind that 2033 is a good year. 2035 is not such a good year, but, but yet. So actually in our plan here, we, we weren't sending people in 2035, but, but you, you could still do a mission in that year with this architecture. And also yeah. SEP. Uh, is very forgiving. Relatively. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, the you know the, the cargo missions actually are, are a different animal because uh, they're very flexible and, and you can launch them uh, you know uh, you know s several months earlier or several months later and still uh, make up for that. So they're pretty forgiving. And, and actually, the, the real advantage of SEP is that you know you can get stuff there that normally would take two SLS launches and do it in one launch. I'm not saying it's cheaper that way to use the SEP because you have to pay for the SEP tug, but you know. It, it, we, we're worried about the ground infrastructure and being able to get off one SLS every six months. And so, you know, by taking one of the SLSs out because you only needed one with the SEP tug, that's a big help. And then the flexibility of SEP lets you uh, move your launches so that they're not all clustered around the departure window that happens every two years, but your SEP tugs can launch years earlier and, and, and it's very flexible. So that really helps out a lot in trying to come up with a launch sequence like, like John did to get them all to fix. And, and just so you know, for the for the, the long term, looking at uh, four people on Mars for a year and sending a crew every four years, uh, that's done with an SLS flight rate of one every six months, except that uh, once every two years, you actually have to get two of them off within the same month, but that doesn't happen until the year 2040. Yeah. So, go ahead. So yes, I, uh, as I said earlier, uh, you know, in order for the internationals to participate, they need to see an a, um, architecture with some level of a specificity so that they can see themselves doing certain elements of it. 
So there, there's a fair amount of debate, and I, I think uh, uh, there are justification on both sides. One, <coughs> as you heard, um, uh, Bill Gersemeyer yesterday said that locking in into a specific architecture uh, has its own limitation because you don't know, you know what's going to come along later. You know, maybe there's a technology that we haven't thought about. And if you lock in into an architecture, then you know, you're stuck and what do you do when something new happens? Um, so that's, there's merit to that argument. The other side of the argument is that so long as you, do, you, know, you remain somewhat ambiguous you know, going further out about what this architecture looks like, um, you know, there's an opportunity cost there, right? The, the internationals don't know, uh, you know how they're going to participate. So that's the other uh, side of this thing. You know, and I, you know, we have uh, talked about, uh, Scott and I participated in the robotic exploration of, uh, of Mars. When we started in 2000, as an example, you know, we didn't think uh, that the sky crane that we ended up using with Curiosity was gonna pan out. So <clears throat> if something happens, you will be able to inject them in, but you cannot be paralyzed by saying, since I don't know what else may come along, I'm not gonna be able to make a decision. Uh, th there is a, uh, so you have to strike a balance. And uh, uh, so we did not, to now uh, to, uh, answer your question, we did not say which pieces would be done by international. Uh, you know, one thing that uh, Bill Gertzemeyer has proved, I mean, he's a master deal maker. He put the space station uh, uh, partnership together. So I think when the time comes, uh, certainly he will be able to draw, uh, you, you know, on that skill to bring other people to the table. So let's go back to the time frame. Uh, can you imagine uh, astronauts on Phobos looking back with Mars looming large in a horizon and uh, you know what that would do for the, uh, the whole journey to Mars? So that's going to happen in 2033, right? And uh, there are, as you well know, there are um, people who say they're going to uh, land tomorrow, uh, right? There are people who... And, and, and so you also have to be realistic. So it is the constraint that I told you, the two sumo wrestlers, keep that in mind, right? They are real constraints. So you can pull it forward, and NRC tried to do that, and you saw what happened. So coming up with solutions that are not practical is a feel-good view graph that we can all you know, sort of applaud, but nothing's gonna happen. So realistically, uh, you know, if you uh, take into account uh, that, um, you know, we're not going to grow much beyond inflation. If that OMB hasn't exactly written a check for the next few years saying that you will grow with inflation, that's a battle yet to be won, right? But to your point, if you are not going to land on Mars until 2039, you better give them something in between. You better do, keep doing things in the lunar space. You better get to Phobos. I, you know, I think that the uh, landing on Phobos would be tremendous, you know, for the humans first time in, a, uh, in the Mars system, landing there, and can you just imagine the images that are com coming back? Think Apollo 8, uh, except on a steroid. Yes. So the little bump that you saw yeah. peeking through, uh, it's uh, a couple hundred million. Okay. So that's 
Yeah. Yeah. So let's see. Yes. We have proved your wisdom. I don't uh, disagree with much of what you say, but let me just add, there is this little secret in Washington that is not the total cost that kills you, it's the annual cost. Okay. So if you allow me to uh, a, a cash flow at, you know, at uh, what I require, then you can do it maybe more cost efficiently. But the fact of the matter is that that's not the way it's run. It is the annual budget, you have to be constrained by that, and that forces you into some of your, the decisions. There are, on paper, technically more elegant solutions, and we have had some in the past. It's not gonna be done. It's not affordable. And so long as we buy into the argument that there is not gonna be another Kennedy moment, you are stuck with a cash flow constraint, and you have to do the best that you can do with that. Uh, Buzz, you had a, it's not the yeah. Kennedy moment you're worried about, it's the Nixon moment that you're worried about. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's right. That is true. That is true. Okay. You know, the, um, uh, the staffer yesterday, the ex-staffer of the senator, uh, uh, you know, yeah. said something about uh, the, uh, uh, that the political system engineering is every bit as important as aerospace system engineering. So uh, that is very much true. <laughs> oh, no. You will keep it to the heart. I don't know what inflation is. You say affordability. Let's talk uh, about something that everybody is familiar with. Percent of discretionary funding. Does this mean that we are telling So uh, I, I thought was, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, like, so. I'm Paulus from Rosa Cruz. Just a quick uh, announcement. And, uh, could the folks who are on the next panel, apologies for not noting her, go backstage and find her? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Buzz. So, Buzz, I thought that I uh, answered uh, at least a, f a few of the questions that you asked. The, we did not assume international. I think it would be a mistake not to. 
but you have to put something on the table that says this is the program so that the international says, I want to build the habitat, I want to build this state. So the answer is it has to involve international, but you have to be reasonably specific about what the plan is so that the internationals can buy in. That's question number one. Um, I, I can answer that question. Okay, so the, the other question you asked about the SLS launches, this thing assumes uh, two SLS launches a year, every six months. We have checked with Marshall and that is the, in fact they need that kind of turnaround to make SLS affordable, right? So, uh, so that's the second question. The, uh, no, no, uh, no we assumed SLS. Now again, as I said, you, you know, you can't, I don't know that the um, I don't know that uh, SpaceX has announced anything that can take 130 tons to the orbit. Their Falcon 9 Heavy doesn't do that. If they do, the government will have the choice of doing that. Uh, so we're showing a an existence proof. Okay, so I mean you're going after the specifics. You can pivot around this uh, architecture any which way with, with the commercial, with the international. So again, this is not a rigid blueprint. It is an existence proof. I think, um, let's try again one more question. Buzz has another one of his, his uh, spitball, which still might be the So what, what is the ultimate purpose of this? What program do you envision that you're working towards at Mars? That is what the architecture is, yes. Towards a permanent state. Towards? What do you mean by towards? Building up, building up the infrastructure that would allow continuous uh, presence at, on, at, at Mars. You have to start building up the infrastructure. So the, every four years that we talked about is gradually building the infrastructure that would allow you a, um, a permanent state. Uh, let's see, I, I think I had a question up there. So you're saying rather that, uh, that NASA would buy into an international, become a partner to an international program, is that what you're saying? Possible? I don't disagree with you. You know, this is not a, just a solely a, a monopoly of an, an American enterprise. It is an international enterprise. Let's see, question back there. Oh, there was a question, okay. Any further questions? Uh, yeah, right here. Yeah, so the, the, the initial missions to Mars would not use ISRU, and the idea is to not have to pay for that up front, but the idea is that over time you, you would on-ramp that. So the initial lander on Mars would be hydrazine NTO, but, 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 but I, I can see that you would evolve that to be hydrazine and LOX. You would change the propellants and you would make your LOX there, and uh, you know, as you, 
had continued missions to Mars, you would be able to build up more infrastructure. You would have more power systems on the surface. Initially, we would use solar arrays that are probably based on the advanced solar arrays being developed for ARM. We would probably use those on the surface of Mars, too, with cleaner systems with compressed carbon dioxide gas. But over time, you would probably evolve to sending nuclear reactors to the surface of Mars. You would do ISRU on a bigger scale. Once you found water on Mars, then you would probably change your propellants for your Mars ascent vehicle to, to, to LOX hydrogen instead of, of, uh, of, of LOX hydrazine. So the idea is, over time, you would evolve to using ISRU for all those things, but you wouldn't do it for the first missions, because we, we don't think that if you look at the affordability, if, if, in other words, the, the first missions will be Conestoga wagons. And over time, we, we, we want to get to the transcontinental railroad, but you know the first settlers, they're not going to use the transcontinental railroad. They're going to use Conestoga wagons. And later on, we'll, we'll get to the transcontinental railroad. Oh, the, rel the reliability of the habitat. So I think <coughs> the benchmark we have now is what's going on in ISSS. And so we can look at, you know, what kind of, of, of refurbishments they have to do, how long those systems last. Uh, so, so the Phobos habitat, I think, is, is likely that could be refurbished and used for another mission. For the deep space hab that comes back, if we save those and, and bring them back to Earth orbit or lunar orbit and refurbish those, you know, th there is the cost benefit of how much does it cost to get the stuff up there to refurbish it and resupply it versus setting up a new one. But, 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 but clearly, the, the, those things are feasible. You have to work out the economics of it. And so we wouldn't propose doing that for the first missions. But over time, yes, I, I would hope that we would evolve to a recyclable uh, 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 infrastructure of vehicles that, that we would use over and over again. All right, I think we're out of time. Yeah. All, right. All right, thank, thank you. you, everybody. Yeah.